Hi, my name is Christy Burns. I produce the Morning Review podcast and help coordinate the Northwest Passages Book Club events when they're live or when they're here, which is virtually. Tonight's event is really special. Uh, that's why we're starting a little late. We got talking with Sandra Singlo and then also Julia Sweeney, all together here in Spokane. So I am going to show you just a little introduction uh, about Sandra Singlo. Composer, comedian, commentator, activist, scientist, daughter, mother, and writer, Sandra Singlo. I write stuff that's not funny, and no one likes it. So, but but I, I value that too, and I think the gift of being able to make someone laugh, and I treasure it so much in other people, is magic, and it's great. It's an absolute good. We should have had you here ten times. You're so funny. Oh my god! All your writing, I really love it. And you're such a rude but true truth teller. You say it like you don't care. You let the chips fall where you may. And and the the new book that look at the uh, the. You know it. You wrote it there. Yes, my, it's my, here. The my, Mad Woman and the Vulva. My years of raging hormones. Why are your hormones raging? Oh, well, thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> menopause is actually a hormonal return to where we were as preteen girls before the fertility cloud came down. We became interested in boys and hair and makeup and cutting up little sandwiches and folding up little socks and nurturing and bonding and putting other people first. Fast forward to age 46. There you stand, cutting up little sandwiches, and suddenly, as if in a dream, the fertility cloud starts to lift, and you ask yourself, why am I cutting up sandwiches for all these able-bodied people? Adventures continue on a Roomba, as does the conversation, and why not have it with a fellow writer and friend who is on that path with you? Julia Sweeney joins Sandra Singlo to continue the conversation on Northwest Passages Virtual Forum. Oh my God, that video made me want to cry. <laughs> so, I know. So, First of all, like I'm so glad that you took a picture of your show. <laughs> it was like a Kukla, Fran, and Ollie mo. It was like, I go, I love Sandra. I love Julia. I like, oh my gosh. Thank you guys. Well done. That was good. I felt part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're pivoting for a moment. Yes. So. I think it's funny we started a little late because yes. Julia, you have this. I know, class. and I'm sorry. Now I'm feeling no, no, so no, bad. No, 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 but I think it's so great. It's talking. such a, it, it's such a sort of Washington State area story of, of just how rich how rich these readers and writers are in this like in in this place. Oh yeah, Seattle and Spokane, and really not Spokane, not as much as Seattle, but almost. Um, but you should say a little a bit. A great literary of, tradition. And they have yeah. Jess Walter, one of today's best writers who lives yeah. in Spokane. Totally. And they have one of the greatest bookstores ever, Auntie's Bookstore in Spokane. And um, I think of Spokane to me as kind of a bastion of um, sanity in the middle of a scary area of the world. Because <laughs> you're very close to Northern Idaho. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yet there is time for contemplation and for writing, which is, I think, a little bit, you know, we've had these conversations and, and works of, um, I, I have said of, and I, I was such a fan of your podcast, not your podcast, your radio commentary series, First World Problems on KCRW, which we've talked about. Oh my God, that was nothing compared to yours. Oh my God, you've been doing it for so long and so much better. But no, no. Okay, no, but, anyway. but of this tradition of like moments of contemplation, when I think of old NPR, like NPR in the 80s and 90s, and this was before um, uh, This American Life, with Ira, when Ira Glass was pre This right. American Life, of, right. even in the NPR news hour, and there's so much news as, as we know in this national conversation that's like, but there was always five minutes before the hour where there would be a two and a half minute commentary, like by Bailey White or some like just about our moments in life that, that are small and and but oh my god but sandra you are my inspiration for so much of this because i've seen all your one person shows i've read all your books and you are the master of the micro moment of this age in my opinion 
And this book is so um, wonderful in that way. Like, like if I was describing it to someone, which I have, I'd be like, well, oh, there's this great chapter about her front lawn and the whole problems of the front lawn and whether, the, and then the neighbor sort of the, this way, and then she feels this way about the lawn and then she calls someone and they think this way. And, and of course I bungle it. I make it sound horrible. So I probably um, cause you to not sell books because I'm too bad <laughs> at it. But, but you are so funny at that stuff. And that is such a gift. Um, I really just love all that from that to the massage chair to just living in this house that you can, you know, you can afford but not afford to fix up. And then managing your kids and then your ex and the way your ex is doing things. I mean, it's really, it was really a bomb reading your book because it just makes you think that other people have as many problems as you and you can be funny about it. Well, pivoting back to you, um, I, I think that we were talking about you before you got on screen of, of how funny you are and your monologues and your books and your personal stories, but are incredibly human. And since, and your, your piece, Older and Whiter, which yeah. it is so, what I, 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 I saw in that, it, it, that we went, it's like, you can make, the same to you, an ordinary day, <laughs> just bickering with your daughter and your husband of, of yeah. just so these are the moments in the day Thank that are God so we can make something funny out of that right um, and, and you know, I was supposed I was... to film that in Spokane and now because of COVID it's postponed probably for a year and a half but anyway, well but you will because all, all those moments in the day that are just the ordinary human moments and I, I was like laughing so <laughs> Aww, hard that's stuff that's that's ordinary stuff in the day and I think that's that's the magic that I have admired of you um, I know, but I'm more inspired by you because I have to say, telling it is hard. Yes, it, it requires its own art to tell it. You have to have more stand up in you. You have to have more timing and landing the joke. But you really are a beautiful writer. I mean, like, that's the skill that I really wish I had. I mean, I really, it's really beautifully crafted, your chapters. I mean, like, it's really, I really, I la I'm laughing and relating, but it's also well written, and that is really rare. Well, thank you, but but back to you. I mean, you're you <laughs> are writing constantly, and you're doing work constantly, and it's really well. I, I wonder if I would ask you: is is yes. part of your process getting up? You've written stuff, and then you will come with note cards, and you'll come to the groundlings and you'll go, and there's such a beautiful structured yet improvisatory feeling that is being- Well, at the Groundlings, I really don't come with no cards. I mean, I mean well, some it's confusing because sometimes the Groundlings has this stand up -y nights where you would come with no cards, but for the most part, you're gonna go and just improvise completely. Um, but I do try to prepare, you know, like, um, Sunday, I spent the entire day because I had a 10 minute set on the uncab, a Zoom uncab, and it went okay. That's the thing you have to realize as a writer, which you know, like it's just like not everything's great, but not everything's terrible, and everything's a potential, you know. So I decided it was Father's Day, and I would rate God of the Bible, Yahweh, against this manual of if you're dating a bad boyfriend or not, certain qualities that he <laughs> might have. And I spent the entire day trying to rate Yahweh against this list of, is he controlling? Yeah. Is he <laughs> jealous? Well, he says he's jealous on every page. It's like, he thinks it's a good quality. Um, <laughs> but then, so I'll do stuff for that. Um, but I'm not very disciplined. Like I wish I was. Like I imagine you must be. Like you really have taken these things like reading the book, you really have taken the opportunity to grab all the details in real time and create this tableau and this story that I am not as disciplined as you or as talented to do. Well, I, I think, what do those words mean? Okay, <clears throat> to go back, because you're very writerly and you're very thoughtful. And again, on your KCRW show <laughs> in the time, like, 
I would listen, and those commentaries were slightly longer than the ones that I would do, not by much, but by a minute or two, and they were quite writerly. And what I admire about your space is that you go in front of the audience and the groundlings, and you are just conversant in the space, and you have your cards, you have your material, but you're completely comfortable. And that's something that not many people, it's, it's not grasping, it's just like, here's how we are, I'm going to try this. And right. and that experimentation is so funny. And everybody is there with you where, where you go, just follow me on this track. Well, and, but it, and, and you'll say, though, and, and my, my friends told me not to do this bitch. And here I go. <laughs> and Ew, my family often tells me that was so funny, but not funny enough. Comfortable, but because... <laughs> You're so intelligent, and that's part of what is the the drama and the excitement. It's it's like a mind where you go, okay, I can land this joke here. Let's do that. And then I also ruminated here, and my friends told me not to do this, but I'm very interested in this. And that sort of brings me back to your um, sort of your your intelligence and your intellect, which oh, yes. then sort of goes and we're going to go all, all over the well, place it's kind of funny because actually this morning i actually wrote three thousand words this morning because i'm writing a short story for the spokane chronicle um this spokane. i mean uh, is it the chron now i'm thinking oh my god questions are already coming in sandra um and um it's not funny at all my new thing is what were you writing about well, so I, had to write a, I had to write a short before. story on the theme of Mount St. Helens erupting 40 years ago. And right, I came right. up with the idea of a guy who is in Seattle, because I was in Seattle when Mount St. Helens erupted. I watched the eruption, and then I saw that the smoke was all heading towards Spokane, which is where I'm from. And Spok Seattle got none of the smoke or the ash, but Spokane got everything, and Northern Idaho got everything. And I imagined a story about a guy who's finally slept with the girl of his dreams that he's been flirting with for a year who's kind of cooler than him and older than him and everything and then he's very titillated and triumphant over this conquering of being able to sleep with this woman but then as he thinks about it he realizes that he's going to quit college and move back to Spokane and marry his high school sweetheart who's a catholic so I guess the idea is a guy who gets too much of what he wants in the big world and decides to make, you know, make other choices. But what of the, I'm, I'm glad that the C word has come up this early because I think that's part of, I, I think one of the last times we Zoomed before we were doing these more public yes. Zooms of, of, I have been, as you know, really fascinated by your Catholicism, well, earlier Catholicism. And oh, I'm more Catholic now in a way. Except that exactly. I and in the but... pandemic, sort of the <laughs> nunnery thing. And just yeah. the spiritual thing. That that is so interesting about comedy and humor that it can be really sort of nested in a in a spiritual, thoughtful way, which doesn't make it less funny. But that's why talking to you, it's both hilarious and then I think about it later. And I, I think that all, all your work and your monologues and your your you know shows are equally like cancer god <laughs> like, and it, it's funny it's what's happening it's what's <laughs> on tv um but now but wait sandra I, we have a question are you ready because it's a good sure. one um one how long have you been writing okay i'm passing we can both answer that quickly um leslie asks what led you to write books about the change women go through that no one really talks about because in the clip um you were talking about that and i just don't think there there's if we stopped all of culture and only had writing about women going through menopause for 50 years we would make one five percent dent into what needs to be done about women going through menopause <laughs> well i love leslie's question and both of us have been writing at least i've been writing for i'm, I'm 58 so <laughs> oh, i started a lot of years not professionally all those years and i think um, with the menopause thing, it was interesting because uh, my editor at the Atlantic for many years wanted me to write about this. I go, I'm 44, I'm 46, I don't know what it is. But then it came upon me of just this chemical change suddenly driving on a freeway, uh, just in the usual Starbucks, Trader Joe's, pizza dough, whatever, United Air Miles. 
there's something about United Air Miles. That, there's something about miles. Where you're looking into the abyss of like, I don't remember my pen. I don't understand this. Where, but, and that's reasonable to go into an existential crisis about this. But this was not that. And to feel that my chemicals and harm, hormones were changing sort of right around 46, which was perimenopause. And so I think some of these things are not, and it was always a puzzle to me why that hadn't been written about, where you have Oprah oh. and like, why this oh was God, a, yes. that is sort of an interesting journey of, of, I don't know if 50 years of feminism is kind of like going, we can't admit that at any point we feel anything odd because we're still making 79 cents on, on the dollar. But to a certain extent, that journey of saying women feel a lot of different emotions and so do men. So there, there's a little bit around this time where Robin Williams and Spalding Gray, like it's kind of like where we saw really talented men have depression and off themselves because I guess they didn't have these you know, touchy feely women's ways of going, I feel I'm really cracking up. Um, mm -hmm. But we could all have a larger bandwidth of admitting the motion, the emotions that we have, I think. What well, do you think? also, I mean, to me, which I think is something that you touch on even in the comedic fic that we saw coming into this, is that um, we're so flooded with these hormones that are about mating and reproducing, you know, all humans mostly not everyone but mostly on average and um and then you kind of your head comes above water and to me that's menopause so you're not saturated with these hormones anymore and you're saying so why did i need to make dinner every night like why did i have to go oh what what, what happened to you um like all these things that are good things those are all good things but um, you don't have to do that anymore. Like you see, you're outside of it. You can, in some ways it's more authentic because you're not doing it for a reason to ensnare or to be better or to mother or nurture. You're doing it because you're actually interested in what happened or, you know, like, and that is such a profound change. It makes me sad that men don't go through menopause. Actually, the world would be better if men went through menopause. If they just stopped having to get a young woman. <laughs> yeah, and I guess they haven't had that. So previously they had the midlife crisis at 45 and they got the, you know, the red. I don't even ball. know what that means though. I mean, what but does it, it mean? Then we had have... ours, but they don't have theirs. Um, I guess but what is a midlife crisis for a man? It's that they get a red Corvette when they're 45 and they start looking for teenage girls the or girls in their 20s. That's not a midlife crisis. That's a continuation. But I would ask you, this is a philosophical question that I don't know the answer to. So you've, you've been in comedy, in comedy, many oh. years. So do you, uh, okay, so there's some, it seems like, com, like comedians are depressives, male comedians versus feel, female oh, yeah. comedians. What do you, do you have anything about humor that either would, I guess debunk these ideas, or I mean, you you well, were stand up is different than um, sketch comedy, and I was mostly a sketch comedy comedian, even though I dipped into stand up. But um, especially now, this last two weeks, because all this crap has come out, you know, about various stand up male stand up comedians and requiring women to have sex with them in order to get time on stage, and other female comedians asking their male cohorts to say something about it and the whole week I thought oh my god I'm so glad I wasn't more of a stand-up like because I could I wouldn't have done well in that environment I mean like I would have it would just I wouldn't I believe them and I think it was terrible and when you watch a lot of these guys stand up it is really misogynist and horrible in ways that I hope we're past that anyway. But in sketch comedy, it was more of a motley crew of communists, everybody having sex with each other. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, it was more of a hippie vibe than it was a patriarchal, I'm in charge and you got to do this in order to get ahead vibe. I never saw that in my, in the groundlings, like, you know, like, so that was a better 
I would say my advice is sketch comedy is a little easier for women than men, but also it seems like sketch uh, stand up comedy is changing. I hope it is, and it will get better for women. I don't know. Okay, but wait, we have another question, Sam. Oh, yay! From Ellen. Hello, Ellen. How do people feel about including them in your work? Oh, this is a good one. Oh, this is your daughter good. is your partner. And is that Julia Sweeney, who you referred to only as Julia? <laughs> <laughs> so great question. And I try, no, this is not, okay. So these characters are sort of mixtures of many other people. And so this is not exactly Julia, although I love the name Julia. So I will use it all the time. Um, so they're, they're, yeah. So they're mixed. But you of changed the name of your partner, for example. I did. In the book. I did because his name is actually Friar, uh, right. which is such an, un it, it's such an unusual name. It's just kind of like, but his middle name is Charles, so Charlie. And, and sort of like people with, like my older sister also, I just changed their names. Yeah. Um, not so that lawsuits don't happen. They may anyway. But where, where <laughs> these main characters, I have pick and choose because, you know, um, yeah, because you they, they stand for certain things and he's been very patient about weathering this time. But I think it is tricky. Um, and I always get that question and it's a great question and I wish it were easier to answer over the years, but I, it's always a tricky journey. And this book was really oh, yeah. vetted by a legal team of like, of I think in the end, always with these sort of comic memoirs, you want to make sure the person who comes off worst is you, so that right. the foibles are your own, that everyone around you is relatively reasonable, and they're going, oh, come on, and you're the one that goes in these journeys. And, and probably that makes better comedy anyway to have the internal narrative right. that goes astray. But I try to vet it, and I have, I will say, I, I have a relative who's a young relative who doesn't show up a lot in this, and I think that I'm not going to say his or her take is so charming on something. There's a detail that is so charming. I said, you said this hilarious and perfect thing. Can I just say that? And this person said, no. And I used it anyway, but changed it because... <laughs> so to be honest, that's a great question. Sometimes I go, you said this thing that is this one line that's so funny and amazing and seems to set off the whole decade and century. And I must put it in there. I'm gonna ask your permission. They say no, and I put it there anyway. But you have to change the idea. Legally, if they're a redhead, you have to make them a brunette. If they're tall, you have to make them short. So there's a lot of legal stuff that you have to do. Good question to change it so they can't sue you. I feel like when I talk to, I feel like I have a general rule of thumb that your parents are fair game completely. Totally. In fact, my my daughter was doing a little comedy routine about me today <laughs> that I found hard to swallow, and yet I laughed heartily. Um, so to can, make a we, point can we? Can we? Can we? Can we? What comedy. was? What was? What did she find comedic? Well, she's teaching coding on Zoom. She's a computer teacher in her room, and I came into Michael after I wrote my three thousand words today, and I guess my voice was loud, loud enough that her students could hear it. And I said, I finished this short story about a man who has sex with an older woman. It was very erotic for him, like maybe too erotic. And then he decides to marry his high school sweetheart. <laughs> and she said she was online with her mother saying that just outside the camera um it was funny i guess okay so i i did i did think i can take it i can take it i can take it um but i it is hard when it comes to your kids and your spouse like you get older your parents are dead <laughs> and you can't it, keep it's older, and, older and whiter it, it it was like they both they both come across as just very patient very busy <laughs> Very yes, cool. that's I created them to be that way, by the way. I'm protecting <laughs> them. Um, but um, 
Yeah, it's hard. And I think that's why I'm moving towards fiction, actually. Really? I have to say, I loved writing this short story so much, which of course is not even based on a real person, but just an imaginary thing that I observed in others. And um, I had so much fun writing it. It felt like I'd been let out of prison. Like I could write about anything. Now, I don't know if I'm a very good fiction writer since this was my first time, but I had so much fun writing it that I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing for the rest of my life, which is a big overstatement. But I, that is not a small question, Ellen, because that is, a. I don't want to portray people badly. I don't want people to think I'm using them for my art, which of course I am. And um, I'm not trying to, I don't want people to think I'm using them for comedic relief, even though I am. And it just seems like it's really, yeah, it's really hard. I, I've never really resolved it. It's been a, always an, an issue. I'm always either trying to protect someone or make them seem better than they were, or um, seeing if somebody I think is a strong-willed person is willing to take, you know, has a good enough sense of humor that I can say this that about them or that. Like, it's, there's something, it, you are constrained. I feel like I'm in chains a little bit with that. Yeah. But when you were writing this morning in this fictional flow, <laughs> so what was, because be I'm, because okay. I, I began as a fiction writer and I love sort of writing plays and eventually in these uh, sort of writing workshops, I just got more and more to, they said, don't write in first person. And then I did. And then that was the <laughs> stuff that people more responded to. Right. Um, it's so immediate. But, but I, I don't know that I loved writing it more than fiction. And I, I began writing plays because I thought nothing would be more delightful than to write it and have people do it like as opposed yeah. to- Yeah, no, I think that's no, but, true. But in your, in your flow this morning- My one day. What, what did that feel like? So I'm thinking when I write, I just remember an incident of the day and that gives me energy of how irritated I was and blah, blah, blah. But when you're writing fiction, what was the pleasure of the flow? Okay. First of all, I have to do a shout out for the great courses. I don't know if you know that thing, but they have a short story class that I'm taking. And I think the author, the teacher is J. Annie McLeod or something. Anyway, um, I've only watched 13 of the 24 half hour lectures about writing short stories. But I was, but she gives you certain tasks after in each episode. And I probably half of them I do and half of them I just go on to the next episode because I don't want to do that task. <laughs> and, um, but some I do. So I was, I was using it to give, like I had to write down words I wanted to be in it and metaphors and feelings. Like they're, every ep episode has a different thing. And I felt, it actually felt like I was let out of jail this morning when I was writing it, it was so heady. Now I will say this, I don't know if it's any good. I'm not gonna say it's bad or good. It still needs an enormous amount of work, but I felt set free by writing fiction. Like, oh my God, how did I not discover this 20 years ago? Like, <laughs> this is really fun. Now it might, cause I also personally respond to first person narratives. Like I'd be more likely to read your book because I believe what you're telling me is true or at least close to true. You know, like there is something about thinking that it really happened and the immediacy of it and the truthfulness of it that is something you can't get in fiction. Like, but there is a freedom in fiction that is so heady and so visceral and so palpable and my ideas started flooding like I have all of these things I've written about like I was working for a long time on a one person show called I as well which I think you saw a version of the Love it. Me Too movement and I could never crack the nut of it but now I realize I can write it as fiction like and maybe no one will read it <laughs> but, but um artistically I think it's freedom for me so I would say the family question is not small it's a huge question. I wrestle with it constantly and I can't, I want to be done with it. I want to, I want to be break free of it because I really like when Mulan was making fun of me for coming out and talking about my short story while her class could hear it. Um, 
to me, that's her right to do that. But I don't feel like I can do that about her. You've said 10 interesting things. I made some notes. So okay. now I will respond. Even though this is supposed to be about you. No, no, I think we're talking about writing because this okay. is a can yeah. and this is happening. These okay. are readers. These are writers. Yeah. We're just okay. talking Fine. writer to writer. You know, what is interesting is there can be something really freeing and fantastic about being in a structured writing situation. And I think one of, in Los Angeles, we have the, what is the Robert McKee story structure class right. that my agent <laughs> made me take. And it was, it was so fantastic for me of hearing about the hero's journey because I was lost oh, yeah. in all of my books. All of my books are first person, et cetera, et cetera. They seem to be wandering journeys, but they're all structured the same way. Right. And, and when you are freed by learning that story structure, mm -hmm. and I love this thing that every story, forget that every story is, uh, the hero rides into the forest to slay the dragon. Halfway there, he realizes back home, his village is burning. <laughs> Call it a she. That's right. every story structure okay, of the modern but time. This, this class would redefine the hero's journey as, okay, now I'm going to mangle her word, but I think it's the epiphant story, which means that your main character is going to have an epiphany at some moment. Like, forget about plot. Don't even think about plot. Think about the epiphany that is going to happen that's going to transform your character's life. And then kind of backtrack into that epiphany. Totally. And that's, that's another way because the epiphany, I think it's that even if your hero or heroine or the they character is depressed on page one, there has to be some energy right. in terms of where they think they're going. Right. But halfway through or two thirds of the way through, they realize they're Something. going the wrong mission. Yes. They forgotten something right it's my mother it's my dad and that so I think the epiphany that that still works also and so I think that um that sometimes in this modern day and age we're a little bit in the memoir category there's there's a feeling of kind of like if I just feel it and my story is important it should come really easily and that it's almost right. they've said almost like therapy like like you know uh you know uh that writing programs are like therapy that we just say what like but in fact there's a lot of structure and craft to it yeah. even if you're telling a very emotive journey and that's been s since saint augustine's time on of yeah. like and that structure and craft can be freeing rather than sitting there every morning going am i feeling it today and uh most of the time you're not and you, it, so you have to kind of uh by the way saint augustine's city of god his memoir he doesn't talk that much about his girlfriend who had a couple of kids by him that he <laughs> left to go pursue jesus <laughs> i want to read her autobiography i would like to see her side of the story how oh. great was it that he discovered jesus okay well exactly and okay, the other wait. now we have another question okay Jessie. Listening to you talk like old friends, true. You don't seem like a mad woman, but I never said that. <laughs> is that a part of you or just a persona to wrap a humorous book around? Oh, this is your question, Sandra. Oh my, and my partner's watching. Uh, no, I, I think um, I would say I'm w one of many artistic people who go from like highly functional to highly not functional, and but. But I think um, part of the writer's thing, it's, it's weird because I think you and I might share this because you're a performer of being in both an introvert and an extrovert of like, yeah. we can perform, but we then have to go back and then feel self-loathing about what happened and then report on stage that we felt the self-loathing. So going back and forth between these uh, stages is kind of a journey It can be sort of hard on the people that we live with when you go I got it and I have six planets right. in Aquarius which is a chore where you go I'm always 
I got it. I've solved it. We're going to do this and that. And then the next day is kind of like, I can't get out of bed because that was so ridiculous. And I just, so I, I think it, it really does vary on that. And it's Jesse, it's a kind phrase. I just want to go back for a moment because I had another thought when you were talking earlier that I want to catch up on when you're talking about, and thank you, Jesse, and I will go back to the madness um, of, of reading fiction and reading um, memoir. And a favorite book of mine has always been Ford Maddox Ford, The Good oh. Story. So, and that's a novel. Right. And that is in a voice. Some of the novels are in a certain voice. And I would say Jonathan Ames, The Extra Man. Why I'm attracted to novels of people with men with amb amb ambiguous sexuality. But <laughs> I just think the voice in Ford Maddox Ford, The Good Soldier, and Jonathan Ames, The Extra Man. Yeah. On page one, you start reading and I will go down that journey. So like Jonathan, the, the extra man, it seems to be a memoir about my life. Obviously it isn't, <laughs> but I relate it to so many things. So sometimes it, for me, it's not necessarily whether it happened or not, but the vo sometimes voice really gets me. Well, it is really great to read somewhere where you go, oh, I identify with this person. They, I feel like what they're saying is what I could be saying. Like you hear their voice and it's partly your voice you know like that's a real you know ego booster and a confidence booster it should be because you can say yeah okay obviously it's not 100 percent your voice but um it's enough of your voice that you feel like if this person can do it then why can't i do it you know like and that is really a great thing when you find that no, and, and I will add to that, I mean, we're certainly in this pocket of time that's a national conversation about racial inequity. So much right. stuff is coming to the fore right now. And to a certain extent in, in arts communities, there's kind of a, you know, BIPOC people of color and identifying in certain ways. And I think I've been having internal conversations with people of like, sometimes to me, voice is voice and sort of growing up, I never said, where is the Asian American lady saying what, like voice can be found. And I think that's part of the complexities of art. Voice can be found anywhere. Well, it's interesting because this book that I was telling you about the book club, we're reading Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin this session. And the book is written by James Baldwin, obviously a gay black man, writing in the voice of a six foot four blonde white guy. So it's a really interesting question. Like, can you write in the voice of people from other cultures or other races? And I think you can. I don't, I think it's wrong to make people feel self-conscious about doing it. I mean, you can do it well or not well, or you can not understand or whatever. But um, anyway, that's a, that's a really interesting topic. And I had described a book that I was thinking, or actually it was a screenplay I was thinking of writing and there were Native Americans in it. And the, I had someone say, well, you can't write that because you're not a Native American. And then I was spooked by it. You know, I was thrown by it. Like I felt like, oh yeah, I can't, I can't have a Native American character in it because that I don't. But now I feel like reading Giovanni's room was like, well, I think I can. I mean, I, if I do enough research and I'm empathetic as much as I can, I mean, anyway, it's complicated. Very complicated. Wait, another question's come in. Okay, Kay asks, for both of you, what are you working on next? Looking forward to seeing older and wider eventually. Yes, I'm hoping, my goal is that on my birthday 2021, I film it in Spokane which is October, 2021. Um, both of you write so much. Will it be another play or one woman show? Are you being creative over this challenging time? Well, I've already answered that. I'm writing a short story for the Spokesman Review. I wanna also, that reminds me, great question. I wanna dial back to when you were speaking earlier about the, the various forms. And I think when you're talking about uh, me also, was that? I as well. I also, I also. Um, that's such a great piece, and there's so much in there. Although we're in a particular time with um, sort of tweeting and showing up and being this, that, that it can be so politicized one person saying something out of context. 
So oh, it's I know. Tricky time to do solo work because you yeah. can have a show that's a full context of a 90 right. minute show. And if there's one sentence that's said out, out that- yeah, They can pull something like, out. And I certainly have experienced that in, in, in work. I'm, I'm trying to have a dialogue with the audience and saying, well, here's an argument about how I would think, but obviously I was wrong and you guys will think that. And it, it, it's just tricky to do the solo. It's really awful. It's this, I call it the new Victorianism. It's this kind of like, oh, you said something we are offended by. Right. Oh, the vapors, I'm so offended. Like, it's really, um, you know, I, I actually now think it's just, especially now that we have COVID and the protests, there's so many things have happened since the, although people are still being canceled, obviously. Um, and there's still people out there looking for you to say one wrong thing and one wrong phrase so they can take you down. Um, but I have to believe that's, that's a passing thing. I mean, at least I hope that's true. I mean, it's so absurd. It's so absurd. I mean, it's so not the way to get the best art and the best comedy and the best anything. On the other hand, yeah, are it, you know, guys who required female comics to give them blowjobs in order to get stage time at stand-up places, am I sad that they're being canceled? No. Right, but, but that, um, that's not really But that's comparable. not the same. But that's, yeah, that's not really it comparable is. to doing a full-fledged 90 minute thoughtful show if you're a female and thought it through to be well canceled at that well, same I, it's just, it's just even to today because like I have a Twitter account that doesn't even have that many followers but some amount of followers and I am scared to comment on some things I'm thinking twice about weighing in on this or that because I just think no I'm and I think I'm a coward about it really <laughs> excerpted right now and I was working on a personal essay for a major news outlet mm -hmm. uh, that has been killed because uh, New York Times, because uh, you can't say the word fat. You can't say my fat pants because that they go. And then, yeah, fat pants are a big part of everyone's life. <laughs> but <laughs> because the anti-body shaming right. folks will take it up on Twitter, so cut that lot. So there is a lot of that right now, and and that may be necessary for our times, but and but but it is tricky. So hence, in terms of what are we working on, it's like could it be a solo show? Could it be this and that or the other? I mean, I certainly have been writing about stuff that's happened during the pandemic quarantine, but we're have still. You? I'm so glad you are because this is so crazy, and I haven't been writing anything about it. Right, but where you put like it, it's and 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 there's a certain where you go. I'm writing. It's not out there yet. It may, and I'm I'm, right. I'm writing on it. Because also, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we don't know. You can't really put anything out now. I feel bad. There's all these TV shows. I have a lot of TV show friends who are writers who are now have gotten the word from the network. You've got to include COVID into your storyline. Like. Right. How and to a certain, even write about that? And to a certain extent, in the in the life of writers, which I think there should be a stand for that, there's a little bit of a time where I'm thinking about younger uh, people who've grown up in this time. There, there is a space to be able to write, and maybe not put it out for a while. Yeah, and let it stew, and you don't have to tweet so it comes back at you or whatever, right. and let let it stew for a while. I have um, to say, for me, I think I'm done with the one-person shows. Like, I want to film older and wider in Spokane at the Fox Theater. I'm committed to doing that. I'll be um, But then I feel older. like that end, done. And, and the COVID quarantine has taught me that because what I've realized is it's so much effort to do stage shows. It's so much energy and effort to do it. And of course, there's the great feeling when it goes well and people are clapping and that is great and you can't replace it with anything and you'll miss it forever and blah, blah, blah. But it's such a huge energy sink, the performance part of it, that I would rather just be writing in my office and trying to make my writing as good as I can. That's how I feel right now. That's what the quarantine has taught me. I want to be a writer and, you know, leave it to the young people to go around to the clubs and rent the place and put down the deposit and do an ad and make sure there's so many seats and get, land the jokes and talk to everyone after. And blah, blah, blah. I'm done. Yeah. 
I love it. Even as you say that, completely agreeing with you, I'm also completely disagreeing with you because seeing you perform live is one of the fantastic life Okay, well, I did it. And yeah, and we may go, because I deal with this all the time. I'm like 58, and it's kind of like, it's like, the menopause lady. And it is kind of exhausting to get out yeah. and you do, do it. But to see, and, and I, I just have to throw down comfortably from my living room sitting on my butt in a chair so you know I, I don't have to like, do, like to do this but it's kind of like it's such a pleasure to see you live and it's an unusual pleasure and it's a distinct pleasure and it's a unique pleasure to have someone start talking about where we all are and go down this journey it's actually kind of amazing and experience that you get nowhere else. It's kind of like where if you open Netflix or Hulu, it's kind of like explosions, young dudes, some sexy young girls, and uh, a sea creature. There, well, are some, <laughs> I do, there are some older people who are doing stage shows, but, and you know, of course, never say never, but I just think, I guess I just think, first of all, I think you have to have this will, okay, now this is going to get me in trouble. But I think you have to have a level of narcissism to keep doing the stage show stuff that I like to think I do not have. <laughs> I mean, like, maybe I do have it and I won't be able to stand it. But it's a long way to go and a lot of energy to get those great nights. And there are great nights, but holy shit. It's, I just look at the young people and I go, go at it. Okay, I think I can learn to accept that I did what I could at the time. And now that I'm taking the great courses short story class, <laughs> um, I feel like I can pivot to a more appropriate thing for someone in their 60s. But I, I, I must add, it is a little bit of this particular time that we're in uh as we begin to wrap up our hour and it was yes. okay just take and i no i'm gonna take us a little bit of a long view okay so yes fran, okay do fran Lebowitz, the great humor the writer great. who wrote exactly two books i believe in the 80s and then has had a whole career died out on that. Years afterwards yeah <laughs> So somehow that, and, and the rest of us are like hacking away. It's like, oh my God. It's like, oh my gosh, in these book tour where you, um, yeah. there is nothing given to you. You have to, where they'll go, okay, we had a marketing meeting. We have a great plan. Sandra, make a viral 20 second video that has 20 oh, minutes. Yeah. Like, That's always a good plan. So, oh, who would have thought of that? A viral 20 second video. <laughs> What an incredible but, idea. But I, I'm very happy with my, I'm very grateful to all the people who published me, but but there there's just a particular time and much have, has been written about, written about it, about the democratization of the arts, et cetera, et cetera. So you just have to hustle harder and book it yourself, but we're going, I'm 60, should I do this? So there's that. Um, and that is understandable, but it is still a blessing. And that's part of what I'm interested in of just these stories of folks and like i say women 45 to 65 America's oh my god when having... you look at the history of literature even taking the short story class which i will just continual continually circle back to um the number of men who have been doing this compared to women and you know when women start when short stories in america started it was harriet beecher stowe and it was women's magazine magazines and they were writing about women's issues and then as with everything, also in movies, people could start really making money off it. And when that happened, all of a sudden it was Jack London and, you know, William Faulkner. And then women weren't even brought up in the short story classes or the novels anymore. They, all the women that were writing at the beginning were just out. And it, now I'm just appalled at the lack of, I mean, there's a lot of women writing fiction now, but my God, there just needs to be so many more and so many more like you and I just talking about the experiences of getting older and you know like it's really unfair what's happened in the culture like what high literature is what high you know like short story writing is and even monologues even in the monologue arena who is remembered like it's yeah damn it anyway we 
persist. And there's persist. persist. Yay, because writing needs to be done. Yes. This, this needs to be read. Your stories tonight were so awesome. Hanging out with you was a blast. <laughs> oh. This book, If It's Not One Thing, It's Your Mother by Julia Sweeney is also available at Auntie's. Auntie is the book? best bookstore in all the land. Oh, it truly, truly one really, of the one of my, I'm bookstores. not kidding. One of my fantasies is to move to Spokane and every Saturday just go work for free at Auntie's, wandering around telling people what books they should They're buy. watching. Julia, they're watching. They will hold Oh, that would be great. Wouldn't that be the best? It would be an awesome that. job. It you would be an awesome job. You should be reading. But that, the thing is, is there is actually also a button uh, um, where we're watching that you can just link and buy this book right there. Uh, but Julia, thank you for being our Spokane connection to hosting Sandra Singlo, uh, Mad Woman in the Roomba, My Year of Domestic Mayhem. Submitting questions today got you a chance to win a copy of the book. So Joyce and Leslie, I have your emails. I will be emailing you for information. You both get a copy of her fabulous book, The Mad Woman and the Roomba. You can buy copies, as we said at Auntie's. There's a link on the page that takes you right there. All of our videos and discussions are archived on our video site, which you can access for free. We could sell tickets, but we aren't. If you feel compelled to buy a ticket, take that cash and instead make a contribution to the Community Journalism and Civic Engagement Fund via the Anovia Foundation. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Aww. Thank you.